Welcome to Statues and Monuments. And in today's programme, some extraordinary stories, a tale of endurance inspiring modern leaders, an 18th century tragic muse, people power, locals fight for a statue of their hero, and the man who saved 100,000 lives. This busy roundabout at Chiswick is named after our first subject. And there's hardly a day goes by, but the traffic reports from West London don't mention another snarl up at the Hogarth roundabout. Hogarth was a satirist and a drawer. But today, his name is more synonymous with traffic congestion. And you can't expect good and decent motorists, really, to pull over here and have a butcher's at his house in Chiswick, not a stone's throw from this roundabout. He was a considerable artist, William Hogarth, and I'm a great admirer. Hogarth was an 18th century painter who filled his pictures with a sort of congestion in colour. Cartooning, it was called. He took the mickey out of things in a big, big way. His work was repeatedly copied, which spurred him on to campaign for copyright laws. And from 1749 until he died in 1764, he lived here in Chiswick. This is his statue, a charming bronze. It stands in the street to William Hogarth. Never Sir William, never got knighted. Satirists don't get knighted. It was always plain, just William. Sculpted in 2001, shows the artist with his dog, Pug. What was here before was a public convenience. Council wanted to demolish that, demolish the toilets for car parking. I got involved with this project because a girlfriend called me one day and said, did you know the council are going to pull down the railings around an old disused toilet on Chiswick High Road? I said, they can't do that. They've taken so many things out of the high road in the past, theatres, cinemas, they're beautiful railings. We've got to save them and use them for something. So I telephoned the local council, pleaded with them, wrote to them, called the local press, and I said, look, I'm going to chain myself to these railings to stop them being bulldozed. I called the local press again and I said, why don't we have a statue of Hogarth within these railings? Somebody once said to me, why do we need a statue called after a roundabout? And I thought, that's exactly why we need a statue. Really, it's hats off to Hogarth, um, my hero, and I hope lots of other people's. So the people of Chiswick won their fight and got a statue to a favoured old resident in the high road. Not forgetting his faithful friend, Punk. The day it was put up, I cried because there's such a human feeling to the expression in Hogarth's face. To capture the essence of somebody is, I think, almost impossible for someone that's not living because you're relying entirely upon biographical material. You have to read what their personality was, uh, you have to understand or try to understand their character. You are fighting always to try to get a three dimensional image from those two-dimensional pictures. So having got the, the research material, you then produce a maquette. The, the bigger version is changed. This arm is different, the hand is different. One goes through it, a whole process and, and you change the thing. I read that he was a pugnacious character in arguments. He was also very sensitive as a human being, didn't like criticism. So I decided on a pose which was uh, rather like a pugilist, standing on his right foot there, his right arm forward, ready to sort of uh, attack the canvas. I didn't want to do Hogarth in his finery. Putting him in a shirt, which he would have worn in his own studio, would be a, a much better choice. When I mentioned this to the, the V&A, they, they just said this was a no-no. Uh, I would be doing Hogarth in his underwear. And uh, so I still stuck to my decision, and, and I did him in his, uh, in his underwear. This is Hogarth's house. 
where William lived in Chiswick for 15 years. Visitors can come now and browse about. Admission is free. This was his summer residence, and records show he made lots of improvements to it. I wonder if he actually did any of the works here. There is a suggestion that he did some of his engravings here, but perhaps not the paintings. Hogarth's got quite modern sensibilities and cared very much about deprived children, uh, cruelty to animals, the equality of people. He's very interested in ordinary people. He wanted to be seen as an ordinary man himself, although he also wanted to be seen as terribly important, and he was very excited when he became sergeant painter to the king a few years before he died. You see wonderful crowds of people, the Londoners of his day, rich, poor, old, young. And there's a lot of black faces, which is unusual. You don't see that in all pictures of, of London scenes. Art galleries like this one in Dulwich, the Dulwich Picture Gallery, you'll see many paintings by William Hogarth. He was one of the few English artists to represent black people in all kinds of circumstances. In the Mariage à la Mode series, you get a black man in the household of the English aristocracy. He's serving sugared chocolate. It reminds us that there were many black people working in the households of the English aristocracy. To own a black slave was to have some kind of status in the society. On the far right-hand corner of the painting is a little boy kneeling beside art objects which have been recently bought in an auction. And that juxtaposition of the black and the art object reminds us that in the coffee houses in England in the 18th century, art used to be sold at the same time as slaves were being sold. It's a fantastic statement, almost a radical statement that Hogarth is making. Beneath all that glamour and politeness and that aristocratic genteel existence is the story of slavery. Hogarth had the ability and wanted to get beneath society's sophisticated veneer. Mercilessly, he lampooned upper classes, exposing seediness, vice, greed, gluttony, and their brutal abuse of the vulnerable. Today, cartoonist Gerald Scarf continues the satirical tradition. When I started drawing in the 60s, and people said, ah, oh, you're very Hogarthian, I didn't know what they were talking about. I then went and looked at his drawings and books and so forth, and uh, I did see a duality of purpose. He did attack society or draw society or record society in a very truthful way. And I like to think I'm trying to do that too, put down the world around me and my age on paper. Everybody in his drawings seemed to be criticized in some way. All the lawyers were crooked. The doctors were quacks. And the scientists were, were mad. So everybody was seen through this rather jaundiced eye. And every time I do look at him, he's a delight. He's full of all the details that one would want to know about that age. 200 years later, he's a popular figure. Yes. Well, he always had a roundabout, didn't he? Yes, yes. But now he's got the statue. Yes. I am so thrilled with the statue. It's an amazing piece of sculpture. The movement in the statue is amazing. And also to be with his little dog. It's, it's such a beautiful piece. This is a statue truly of a local hero, erected with the support of local Chiswick people. I think it works well. It's a great concept. And though it took effort to get it put up, well worth it. Shouldn't other local communities and businesses consider putting up a statue to a local hero? The statue's always a curiosity and often an encouragement to the good and bright side of young people, to celebrate in the street people who have led extraordinary lives that have so enriched the rest of us and made London such a joy. On Paddington Green stands a statue to a woman who was in her time perhaps the greatest actress in England. And it's a bit of a rare bird because there are few memorials to women in London. 
exceptions would be Nurses Cavell and Nightingale. And there's a marker to the murdered WPC Yvonne Fletcher. And Dr Louisa Aldrich Blake, boxer and cricketer. This is a hidden statue, well, not very conspicuous, to a lady who was incredibly famous. A star, a big, big star. Mrs Sarah Siddons was an actress. She burst upon the stage and in London and the provinces for 30 years. She drew packed houses and had thousands of fans following her until her retirement in 1812. She was what today you'd call an A-list celeb. The equivalent of front page of Hello magazine, her face and her figure. She was painted in her time by all the leading painters of the day. Thomas Gainsborough lost his temper and apparently angrily threw his paintbrush down and shouted at her, damn it, madam, is there no end to your nose? The pose in this statue of her was inspired by Joshua Reynolds's painting, The Tragic Muse. Sarah Siddons was particularly known as an actress of tragedy, and people like that. At her funeral, which was in Paddington, some 5,000 people attended. And how many actresses today could pull in a crowd like that? Here at uh, Marble Arch, Great Cumberland Place, is the statue to Raoul Wallenberg. He was a Swedish diplomat dispatched to Budapest in 1944 to rescue as many Jews as possible from the trains to Nazi extermination camps. He saved 100,000. Raoul Wallenberg came from a very rich and very influential uh, family in Sweden. He worked with a gentleman who was of Hungarian origin. That's really why he started to be interested in, in uh, the Hungarian situation and the situation for the Jews in Budapest towards the end of the war. What he did was he issued these shoots passes, which were, they were forged documents, but somehow, he got the Nazi authorities to accept them. I don't have personal memories myself, but my mother was a refugee from Nazi Germany, and my grandmother on my father's side chaired the Welfare Committee of the Refugee Committee in this country. And there is something very remarkable about Wallenberg, who wasn't a Jew, who just looked at what was going on and said, this is unbearable, I'm going to do what I can. He wasn't the only one, but the numbers that he saved were quite phenomenal. And the sculptor was Philip Jackson. Philip, what inspired you to do it this way? Well, I wanted to have this wall that cuts them off from the sort of background that you see here, um, and to give that sort of feeling of imprisonment. And you can see that he's pulling his coat around his shoulders as though he's sort of sheltering from the sort of hot blast of the Holocaust. It's fairly textured, the whole thing, in fact, with the exception of the head, which is much finer worked, right. and that makes the viewer look towards the head and look towards the sort of intellect of the man. Were you always able to, to, to have a whole figure or...? It was originally going to be a head and shoulders and uh, I read up the story of Wallenberg and I was so inspired by it that I felt head and shoulders isn't going to do this man justice because he's really one of the great heroes of the 20th century and I felt that something bigger that represented not only the man, but the deed was essential. The statue of Wallenberg's in London, uh, at least in part because some of the campaign to remember him actually has been based in London, because a lot of Jews actually came to London. Round the back, you've got all these sculpted passes. Yes, and if you look at the bottom of the wall of Schutz passes, you see that one of them has fallen open you'll see a mother and two children because a Schutzpass could save 
one, two, three, or four people. And so 30,000 shirts passed has saved 100,000 lives. And I wanted to get this feeling of quantity into the sculpture, so people looking at the back of the sculpture will get some idea of the mass of humanity that he saved. As the architect, I work with the sculptor. I have to coordinate all those involved with the project to ensure that the statue is presented to its best advantage and really enhances the area. The statue is positioned in the square near a synagogue and is positioned at that particular angle so that when you come out of the synagogue you see the profile of Wallenberg. You can imagine one person being saved, you can imagine ten people being saved, but 100,000 is almost an unimaginable number. And he didn't need to do it. He didn't need to do it, no, because he could have sat the war out. And he was Christian. He was a Christian, yes, and, but he was a man with a mission. I think he, you know, from a very early age, he had this notion that he had a great deed in him. The memorial in London is one of the very best monuments I've seen of the Wallenberg. It's a memorial to somebody who showed immense humanity, and it's national and international. As it says in the book of Proverbs, the memories of the righteous is a blessing. But the end of Raoul Wallenberg is a mystery. He was returning to Budapest in 1945. But by then, the Russians were beginning to occupy Hungary. The Russians said they knew nothing of him. Maybe he was uh, killed by the Nazis. And then some Soviet prisoners said they thought they'd been with him in a labor camp, in a prison. The Russian officials later admitted that, that he may have died in one of their jails. Nothing is certain but that suddenly and mysteriously he disappeared in 1945. Behind me is the public school Dulwich College. It was founded in 1619 by an actor, Edward Alain. Dulwich has schooled a fair few illustrious names, like P.G. Woodhouse, the novelist of the Jeeves and Wooster stories, the governor of the Bank of England, Eddie George. But there's one old Alainian, as they like to call themselves, who's remembered at the school for exceptional character, for caring for comrades and for being there when days and nights must have been rough, very rough. That's the explorer, Ernest Shackleton. Ernest Shackleton was the Antarctic explorer and his statues near the Albert Hall in Kensington on this corner of Exhibition Road stuck into the wall of the Royal Geographical Society. It was put up in January 1932. The sculptor was C.S. Jagger, one of the big sculpture names of the 20th century. And doesn't he look snug in his niche? Mr. Shackleton. But he wasn't supposed to be there. He wasn't supposed to be there at all. The statue of uh, Shackleton by Charles Sergeant Jagger uh, was originally intended to be in a London street or square. To be seen in its full glory in the round. For various reasons, it ended up in a niche at the Royal Geographical Society. We think this is unfortunate. I myself think it should be in Trafalgar Square on the empty plinth. It looks very disappointing on its niche. It's frontal and it's up too high and it doesn't register nearly as well. But why should we have a statue of this man? His great expedition aboard the Endurance ended unsuccessfully. In 1914, Shackleton had prepared an expedition to cross the Antarctic. This was Shackleton's third trip both Scott and Amundsen had conquered the Pole, so to speak, 
and Shackland decided that to return to Antarctica, the motive would be to carry the British flag across the entire continent in a splendid imperial gesture. He had uh, got together a crew of 27, and he landed in the Weddell Sea. He had been told by the very experienced, wise Norwegian whalers who knew the area that it was a particularly bad year for ice, and that it was foolhardy to proceed. Nonetheless, uh, he proceeded to the Weddell Sea, and the ship got nipped in the ice. The stress among the ice got so great that the ship was actually crushed and sank. But his skill ensured that he and all his crew survived. They took three small lifeboats. For seven days, they traversed between the ice and Elephant Island for a distance of 100 miles in the most appalling conditions of hunger, exposure. Once they were landed marooned on Elephant Island, where most of the men stayed for five months until they were eventually rescued, Shackleton decided to take the James Caird whaler through the huge seas of the, the wildest ocean in winter, 800 miles to South Georgia. But just before they arrived, there was a hurricane, and the James Caird was nearly dashed to pieces on the rocks. After no fewer than four attempts, Shackleton managed to take a boat to save his men. They were down to cold limpets. All the seals and penguins that they'd been eating were gone. But what do we now think of Ernest Shackleton as a man, as a leader? Because reputations, they do reputations, kaleidoscopically change from generation to generation. Shackleton is still an inspiration, even in the 21st century. The great thing he did that very few explorers have done in the Antarctic is to bring all the men home safely. And he put that as an aim above all else. He gave up getting to the South Pole in order to protect people for whom he felt great responsibility. Uh, we hope the boys learn from that. They all, of course, get to see the James Caird. They mostly walk past it every day and they learn much about the expedition and the heroic sailing from Elephant Island to South Georgia. So he is very much a great hero for them. Ernest Shackleton survived, along with all his shipmates and fellow expeditionaires. But on a later expedition to the Antarctic, he had a heart attack and died in January 1922 on board his ship, The Quest, in South Georgia. The funeral was in Montevideo, the capital of Uruguay, but Ernest Shackleton is buried in South Georgia at a spot on the map of the South Atlantic called Gritviken. No matter what you achieve, if you achieve something outstanding, I think it remains an example throughout all time. We feel quite strongly that the college should have a statue of Sir Ernest. There is only one in existence in London. We felt that it would be right to clone it if at all possible. We have permission to do this now. We know it can be done. Uh, all we need is the odd £30,000 to put it right. Yeah.